For more than a century, Central Baptist Church in downtown Noonan, Georgia, has been keeping house for God. During that over 110 years, Central Baptist has served not only its members, but its community as well. Worship has always been a primary focus of the life of Central Baptist Church. Since God gave us His best and His only begotten Son, we feel compelled to give God our best. From the way we dress to the music we sing, we realize we are in a holy place when we're in God's house. Now, let's worship the Lord as we join this past Sunday's worship service already in progress. Well, it is a joy for me to welcome all of you to worship at Central Baptist Church on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. If you're visiting with us today, we are honored by your presence and would like to encourage you some time along the way to locate a visitor's card in an offering rack near you, complete the requested information, and return that card to us, uh, perhaps by putting it in the offering play. Also hope that you'll not rush away at the end of the service, but you'll allow people around you to speak to you and would hope that you would perhaps also come by and speak with me as well. I'd love to meet you. We're meeting so many wonderful new people and trying to get names and faces put together. So we'd appreciate your giving us that opportunity for you as well. We welcome back from vacation and chronic and Sandra uh, Fuller, and we also welcome today Dr. Carmen Skaggs, daughter of, where did she go? <laughs> oh, over here, I'm sorry. Uh, last saw you on the other side. <laughs> Dr. Carmen Skaggs, daughter of Bob and Minla uh, Trammell. Uh, Minla, I always get that name. Did I get close? Min okay, thank you. Uh, you, you tried to get it straight with me to begin with, and uh, she's also our guest soloist today. We're delighted to have you back home and uh, leading in worship today. I remind you that Vacation Bible School is all this week, uh, daily drop-off beginning tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 8.55. Bible School starts at 9 o'clock. There's a meet and greet session tonight from 6 to 7 here at the church. And on Thursday the 14th from 2 to 4 o'clock and 5 to 7, anyone, and that means all of us, are invited to come, if you wish, uh, to help pack meals for the Stop Hunger Now project. And then on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock uh, to come and help load the truck uh, to share these meals uh, with the Stop Hunger project. Uh, 7 p.m. Family Missions Night to load 40,000 meals on the truck, 40,000. So there's a big task, a great opportunity, and uh, we appreciate what Reverend Faison is doing, Katie doing, and uh, all those who will be working in Bible school this week. Uh, please continue to remember in your prayers and thoughts the missions teams that are in North Georgia and Wyoming. I've been in touch with them this week. They're all doing well. Uh, having a good time and working hard. And also include in your prayers uh, fellow members and friends who are traveling. We have people traveling literally all over the world. Uh, Central Seniors, your twice a month breakfast fellowship will be this Wednesday at 9 o'clock at the Chick-fil-A Dwarf House on uh, Bullsboro Drive. And many of you may know uh, that there is a fellowship meal over at the Blackburns following worship today. It was focusing upon those who come to early worship, so I guess you're really not included. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. It was to focus on early worshipers and senior adults, so if you consider yourself one of those groups, and any I'm sure would be welcome to attend as well. I uh, will remind you that on Wednesday evenings we continue to meet in the chapel at 6.30 for a new program or worship study opportunity. We're calling it Midweek Worship and Bible Study. A chance to study and fellowship and sing and pray together. And this week we begin a new series on the Beatitudes given by Jesus as a part of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Again, you are welcome here, every one of you. Come with your gifts, your pain, your hopes, your fears. Come with the traditions that have helped you, as well as those that may have hindered you. Come with your experiences, the ones that have made you and perhaps have broken you at times. Come with a mind ready to engage and a heart open to discern. Come and listen for the sacred spirit that called you to love your neighbor wholeheartedly, seek justice, create peace, and practice compassion. Again, all of you are welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church.
Please join me now for the call to worship. The Lord, our God, gives to each one of us a sense of blessing, security, and confidence. Our life experiences reassure us that we can always trust in God's goodness and compassion. For God alone is our refuge, our place of safety. God's presence is expressed to us in many ways, which lead us into a closer relationship with God. For God alone is our refuge, our place of safety. Let us worship our holy and glorious God. Let us pray. We rejoice, O God, that the earth and all who live in it are yours. We who live in your beautiful world count this life a privilege beyond all other. We are not perfect, God, yet you continue to forgive and love us. We praise you this morning for your refuge, your strength, your love, and your grace. May our time of worship here today leave no doubt in our hearts that you are the King of glory, not only in our lives, but also as we witness to those around us. Amen. <clears throat>
of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. May I have all the boys and girls join me in the front? Good morning. <laughs> Raise your hand if you like to exercise. All right. When I exercise, I go running. I do not like to do it, though. It is not my favorite thing. But I have to keep in shape or, or do something to keep my body healthy, right? But sometimes I find it a lot easier to just talk about doing it. <laughs> so I go running three times a week. And I don't really go running three times a week. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I had a really, really good idea. You want to hear my good idea? Look, I have this exercise videos here. Look, what if I took these and I put them under my pillow at night and I slept like this? Do you think I would get in shape like that? No. No? You don't think that would work? All right. Well, it does take a lot of work to exercise, so I guess I'll just have to do it. It's kind of like being a disciple for Jesus. You can't just talk about it. You can't talk about the things you're going to do for Jesus and for God. You have to actually do it. You have to go out in the community and tell about Jesus. You have to give money to help the things that help in his kingdom. You have to do lots of things. You can't just say, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to do this for God, and then not do it, right? Oh, it would be a lie. That's even worse, because then you're doing something else that's bad. So you have to actually do what you're going to say you're going to do. Just like when you're exercising, you actually have to do it. You can't just talk about it or sleep and get it through your pillow, right? You actually have to do it. Let's pray. Lord, help us through your Holy Spirit to be true disciples of your Son, Jesus, by following him and doing the things that he wants us to do. Amen.
We have offered our praise to the Lord this morning, and as we continue our worship, let us prepare our hearts for confession. Let us pray. Compassionate God, when we become fearful of things happening around us, you deliver us. When our worries begin to overcome us, you are our protection. When our lives crumble, you remind us that there is hope in you. And when the world silences our hope, you give us the words to confess our faith. Lord, even though we know you are there to deliver us, protect us, and give us hope, there are times when we still allow our fears, worries, and doubts to defeat us. God of hope, we lift our prayers to you now. Whenever we call, you are always there for us. You give us peace because we know our lives are in your hands. Amen.
Let us pray. Father, from whom all our blessings do come, we pray that you would help us to take time right now to thank you for what you have provided and with willing hearts give back to you a portion of what you have given to us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We now have the opportunity to think about and pray for each other. This past Thursday, the 7th, Tom Garner's great-granddaughter, Jackson Nicole Whitaker, did not survive complications during a premature birth. Her service was held yesterday, and we remember Tom and, of course, all his family. I think one of the most difficult things I've ever done as a minister is conduct a service like that. We also continue to remember uh, Judy Thompson and her family and the death of Dr. Bob Thompson. And we also now remember Margaret McCall and her family and the death of her mother, Jessie Seahorn. Uh, the Jesse's family will be receiving friends this afternoon between 2 and 5 at the Carmichael Hemperley Funeral Home in Peachtree City. And tomorrow at 1 o'clock, there will be a graveside service at Westminster Memorial Gardens, also in Peachtree City. We continue to pray for Dr. Ernest Barron. He's had some stable days, and we're grateful for that. We're also pleased to report that uh, David Boyd has been showing improvement in the last few days, and we're grateful for God's work in that regard. We also thank God for timely installation of two coronary artery stents for Dirk Roundtree, and uh, that happened on Friday, and he went home before the day was over. And we continue to pray for Tyler Rollison as he has additional tests tomorrow and hopefully additional surgery in the next few days as well. I know there are other concerns that you have, you hold in your heart, and I invite us now to bring all those concerns and thanksgivings to the Lord. Lord, we gathered here this morning in anticipation of meeting you spiritually so that you may enrich our lives and equip us for more effective living. We acknowledge you as the giver of all good and wonderful gifts, including friends and comrades in the faith. Most of all, we thank you for providing the gift of salvation, the daily companionship of your Holy Spirit, and the assurance of life everlasting in your presence. Increasingly, Lord, 
we are aware of the complexities of life. We find ourselves often longing for simplicity. Grant to us the wisdom we need to pursue your desires for us and your way in a world which seems so different from biblical times and which also seems so different from the way many of us grew up. We need you to know how to live in challenging days. We need your instruction to teach us and to guide us. We continue to be startled and grieved with the continuing outbreak of violence in the streets of America. We pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones. And we pray for wisdom and your guidance for those who have the responsibility for guiding and protecting our communities and our nation during these turbulent times. We include in our prayers those with judicial authority and responsibilities, how important they are to ensuring our safety and our freedom. And we pray for our own local public safety folks as well as those throughout our nation and our world. And Lord, we pray for the healing and encouragement of those in our family of faith, many of whom we mentioned a moment ago, and others we do hold in our minds and in our hearts. We don't name them, but they're just as important. These who struggle with pain and illness, give them patience, give them comfort and healing within your will. We also pray for those who continue to deal with grief, these who are recently grieved, and others who continue to grieve, like the Alfords and others. We never get over losing a child or spouse or a friend or a neighbor. We also pray for those who are lonely, who feel that no one cares. Help us to change their minds. We also pray for those who desire healing and wholeness and those who are recovering from serious illness. And we pray for safety through surgery that you've already given. And these will be facing tests and surgery this coming week and the days to come. I pray that you will grant all of these, indeed all of us, a keen awareness of your presence and grace in our lives. We pray all of this with faith and with confidence and with thanksgiving through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now encourage you to perhaps follow along in a copy of scripture that you brought with you or you find in the pew rack for our New Testament reading, which is the foundation for our sermon this morning, Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28. We believe that Luke, the physician, is probably the one who wrote this book, and he shares with us Verse 24, now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and thought, taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You have known of churches named St. John's, St. Mark, St. Matthew's, even St. Mary's, St. Elizabeth, St. Thomas. But have you ever heard of a church named St. Apollos? Or have you ever known a person by the name of Apollos? Very likely the answer to both those questions is no. Yet, as we look at our text for today, we quickly see that Apollos was a very significant person in the New Testament. He was one of the most outstanding examples of what it means to grow in faith that we have in all of Scripture. Indeed, he is what someone has called a patron saint of those Christians who are growing but who need to grow more, though one who is maturing in Christ but needs to mature even more. Even so, he's one of the most winsome personalities in all the early church. What a remarkable person was Apollos. And as we look at the portrait that Luke draws of him, uh, we are able to find truths and thoughts and characteristics that would inspire us and perhaps we would do well to emulate. For example, in verse 24 in our text, we see that Apollos was educated. Luke tells us that Apollos was a Jew from Alexandria, that great ancient Egyptian city with an enormous Jewish population. It was in Alexandria that Jewish scholars became famous for studying the Old Testament as allegory. That is, they were able to see hidden meaning behind the facts and the events that were described in Scripture. Schooled in this approach to interpretation of Scripture, Apollos had a firm grasp on the Word of God. He was well educated, and people who knew his educational background respected him for the discipline and the scholarship that he exhibited. He was also, according to verse 24, eloquent. This Greek word here means that he not only had knowledge but he was able to express what he knew with a, an appeal that drew people to him, much like a magnet. We might say he had a way with words. He had a silver tongue. Apollos was a, a communicator par excellence. Continuing on with verse 24, we see that Apollos was also erudite. Luke describes the fact that he was well-versed in the scriptures. Many of the pious Jews of that day would memorize large portions, sections of scripture by heart. Maybe that was true of Apollos as well. He showed knowledge and learning. And people who heard him were easily convinced that Apollos knew what he was talking about and he expressed himself in such winsome ways. He was also enthusiastic. Someone asked Mark Twain one time what he owed, to what he owed his success. And the famous humorist replied, I was born excited. And so was Apollos. The scripture said he was burning with enthusiasm. A leader needs to believe in what he or she is doing and convey that to others. If we do not act as though and express as though what we believe and say is important, how will anyone else feel that way at all? Apollos certainly believed in what he was doing, and therefore he was enthusiastic. He was burning with enthusiasm, the scripture says. So you can see why I made the statement that Apollos was Indeed, a winsome personality. He was educated, he was eloquent, he was erudite, he was enthusiastic. Indeed, he was a significant leader in the early church. And he also had those characteristics of leaders that all of us would be drawn to, even in the 21st century in our churches today. Notice a few more details about this sterling New Testament personality. He had gifts. 
He had gifts and he used them. Granted, there were some inadequacies in his understanding of the faith. Granted, he was a little inexperienced. Granted, there were some things he could not do. But one of the major points of this story that we focus upon is that Apollos did what he could do with what he had. He discovered his spiritual gifts and he used them to share the love of God with the world in which he lived. Of course, his main gifts were teaching and preaching. And that is why he drew quite a following. You probably remember Paul writing his first letter to the Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is saying, I hear that you all are arguing among yourselves down in Corinth. I hear some of you are saying, I belong to Paul. Others say, I belong to Apollos. Others say, I belong to Paul. Others say, I belong to Christ. Don't you know you should not argue and fuss about who you're following? Well, it's just a brief glimpse into the fact that Apollos was popular. People were drawn to him because of his education, his gifts, his personality, his charisma. He had gifts and many were willing to let him use his gifts. Someone has written the greatest sin in the church today is not some great evil or some huge sin or group of sins, but the greatest sin in the church today, some contend, is that many in the church do little or nothing. They let others they consider to be more gifted or more skilled do all the work. The number one idol in the church, this writer contends, is the God, uh, the God of comfort. That same person went on to write, comfort is not a bad thing, but if comfort becomes your God, you may miss enjoying an even better thing, and that is commitment. Or we may enjoy another good thing, fellowship, one of the great gifts to the church, one of the true blessings of the church, but fail to experience an even better thing, and that is service, giving ourselves away to others. The tragic consequence is that in many churches, and I'm sure that it's certainly not true of Central Baptist Church, so don't get too defensive in the next couple of minutes, okay? I'm sure it's not true here, but it is true, as studies have been made of churches across America, that probably 20% of the people give 80% of the money. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Apollos is a model for those in those kinds of churches, those comfortable Christians who need again to hear the call to commitment, the call for everyone to give a portion of what one earns and also use gifts of leadership and teaching and ministry. Apollos had gifts and he used them. When Philip, Keller, <clears throat> excuse me, when Philip Keller was putting together his book, Splendor from the Sea, many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with it. It is a book that is inspirational in that it describes how God uses people in some of the most remote parts of North America to share God's love and God's grace. When Philip Keller was putting this book together, he included some line drawings by a dear woman who had spent long, lonely years as a lighthouse keeper's wife on the rugged west coast. One of her lifelong ambitions was to use her talent, her gifts, to do something beautiful for God, as she put it. So just before the book was released, Keller went to visit this woman. She had cancer and was in her last days. And when Keller showed her the book, including her pictures, her line drawings, she whispered in his ear, which was about all she could do, is whisper, Philip, our Heavenly Father is so faithful. God has spared me to see my work and my talent that God has given me in his honor. 
she had a gift, a special ability, and she gladly used it for her Lord. And now all these years later, 50 years later, after the publication of the book, people are still blessed because she used her gift. Each of us has been given at least one spiritual gift to serve God. What is yours? What are you doing with it? During the transition process that will begin in earnest in September, you'll be given the opportunity to identify your gift. And one of the joys I have had over many years now leading churches through transition is to help people identify their gift or gifts for ministry. And then to see how people begin to focus on that one or two gifts that God has given. And to see the energy or the passion that surrounds that gift. And then see how people can slough off guilt for not doing something. Somebody tries to talk them into doing that is a good thing but they really aren't gifted or passionate about. And see how when people focus on that gift or gifts with the energy and the passion that goes with it, how the church then blossoms and grows. One way this congregation or any congregation understands what its future may be is to identify the gifts that are given to the people whom God's spirit calls together to form that congregation. And we'll be doing that as we form a dream for the future, focusing on what God has gifted you to do and given you passion to do. Apollos is a good example, good model for all of us. He discovered his gifts, his God-given abilities to do ministries and gladly use them for the Lord's work. But he not only had gifts, he had guidance in this story about Apollos that we focus upon today, we notice that he was offered guidance and he took it. The gifts of Apollos are obvious as I've been sharing with you, but two phrases in the text cast a shadow over what otherwise is a bright portrait of a brilliant young Christian man. In verse 26 we read, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. Did you notice the order there? When the woman and then the man, God was using women in leadership back then and all the way back in the Old Testament and all the way back to the creation. Anyway, that's for another time as well. And I know you affirm that, right? When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they quietly took him to the side and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Verse 26. Then these two older leaders, this godly wife and husband, saw that something was missing in Apollos' life. They saw his gifts. They recognized his education. They knew he was a great communicator and that he was winsome, had a wonderful personality. They could tell that he was growing in the faith but he needed more growth, and he needed some guidance. Apollos is the patron saint, if you please, of those in the church today who are bright and gifted, who are growing in the faith, but who need to keep on growing, who need more spiritual growth. They understand many things they need to know, but not everything they need to know. They need guidance. At least two truths come from this part of the scripture that I want to share with you briefly. For one thing, this experience with Apollos reminds us that we all can receive guidance from others. Had Apollos not understood this, his life would never have been enriched by Priscilla and Aquila. Picture the scene. Here is Apollos, educated, erudite, a hot shot preacher, holding people spellbound, riding a wave of popularity. 
And here is an older, quiet, modest couple, Priscilla and Aquila, wife and husband, who were leaders in the early church, taking him aside quietly, not making any fanfare over it, not wanting to embarrass him, and simply whispering to him, Apollos, you're so gifted. God can use you in so many wonderful ways. But we have noticed some inadequacies. And we'd like to help you quietly, without any fanfare. We'd like to mentor you. Well, you know, Apollos could have reacted by saying, inadequacies and me? You've got to be kidding. Or maybe he could have said, me learn from you? You're old school. What do you have to offer to a young whippersnapper like me that's on top of his game? His ego could have gotten in the way. But the implication of the story is that Apollos listened and learned and as a result lived a fuller, more complete, more useful life. For he understood that all of us can be guided mentored, if you please, encouraged by those who've been in the faith longer than we have. There's also another side, a second truth, and that is this experience reminds us older ones that we can give encouragement to those who may be younger and less experienced than we are. Think how Priscilla and Aquila could have responded. They could have said, this young man is too bright for his own good. He's brash. He's egotistical. We need to corral him. And we need to let him know that just because he's bright and because people are attracted to him, he doesn't have everything he needs. Let's spread the word in our circle of friends that people should not pay any attention to him and certainly should not follow him. Or they could have said, <clears throat> what does he think he's telling us about Christ? We knew Jesus before he was ever born. <laughs> or they could have said, this guy wants to change the way we do things, and we don't like that. We're really comfortable the way we're doing things. And whatever you suggest, don't suggest we change a thing. What does he know? But the implication of the story is that Priscilla and Aquila went to him with understanding, with compassion, and encouraged him to build on his God-given gifts and to go ahead and use his leadership style, even though his style was very different from their beloved Paul. One of the major challenges in the 21st century church is the tension between generations. It is not uncommon for differences to exist between age groups. They always have. But we've been more alert to those differences in recent years. Differences over style and worship, selection of music, how children are taught, even how the church manages, invests, its income and how it spends its money. And loyalty is expressed differently between generations. Young people are tempted to say, what are you doing for me today? Not what you did for me yesterday, but what are you doing for me now? While older people are more likely to be loyal to the church even if their needs are not being met. What is expected of the minister and other staff often varies by generation. This is another area we'll do more focus on later. But Apollos is a model, an example for all of us. We can and should learn from each other. And we must seek to accommodate the needs and expectations of everyone within the congregation. And when older and younger people work alongside each other, have conversation with each other. And the ideas and the thoughts are respected mutually. And there's some give and some take. There is no limit to what the church can become. 
And there is no limit to how effective the church can be with all the people talking to each other. Every generation has something to offer to each other. And also, I finally would suggest to you that Apollos also had goals. Apollos had goals, and he reached them. According to verse 27, we learned that he wanted to go to Achaia, the Roman province that comprised most of ancient Greece, south of Macedonia. Corinth was in Achaia. It is likely that Apollos desired to be Paul's successor, many scholars suggest, that is, his successor in Corinth. Apollos had gold. He had a vision. You remember the Old Testament sage once declared, where there is no vision, the people wander aimlessly. Where there is no dream, the people perish. Our dreams, our goals give meaning and add energy to our lives. When we no longer dream, we no longer have goals beyond ourselves, we suffer from vegetableitis. God uses people who have goals and who keep on reaching them until they're accomplished, regardless of a person's age. Dwight L. Moody, a great preacher of another era, once scribbled in the margin of his Bible beside the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. If God be your partner, make no little plans. Due to the fact that we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundant, above all, we seek or think or even dream about, we need to set big goals in our individual lives and in the life of this congregation. Though you've had a great history, a wonderful heritage, you ain't seen nothing yet. Excuse me, Professor. The best is yet to come. Why shouldn't this church keep on being the model for historic, innovating Baptists, demonstrating how distinctive Baptist principles may work in a pluralistic 21st century society? The same God who enabled Apollos to reach his goals is also available to help us reach ours. Apollos, model of Christian growth. During this season in the Christian calendar called Ordinary Time, with its emphasis upon spiritual growth marked by the color green to remind us this is a time for life and growth, may we allow this marvelous biblical mentor of the faith be a challenge to all of us to be open to identifying our gifts and using them for God's work. Be ready and receptive to receiving guidance from each other and blending the needs and ideas and gifts of young and old. And then let us together dream great dreams, set challenging goals so that God may keep on doing a wonderful, creative, magnificent work in and through this congregation. May it ever be so. Amen and amen. In a moment when we are led to sing our departing hymn, if you'd like to become a member of Central Baptist Church or if you'd like to share with me some decision or decisions that God is nudging you to make, this would be a good time for you to come forward and share that with me.
It's been wonderful to worship with you this morning. And I pray that you'll have a safe, wonderful Sunday afternoon. And the rest of this week will be totally blessed by God Almighty. May we pray. Now may the one who began a good work among you bring it to completion in God's own timing. And dear Lord, I pray that every person here will experience in abundance the grace, the peace, the love, and joy of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you will keep us safe until we meet again. And now I want to encourage you to savor this moment of silence, reflecting on what you've experienced even in worship today before returning to a world that is filled with noise.